This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's October, my friends. That means Halloween is right around the corner. And boy, do I have some good yarns to spin this month. This episode is going to be a little different. I'm not going to go into the folklore that surrounds Halloween, because I did that last year. I will just touch on one thing that really fascinates me. The notion that the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest. Say what you will about anything else, but you can't deny the feeling that you have around this time of year. It's thick in the air. An eeriness that you can't quite explain. The feeling of being watched. A noise far off in your home. Movement out of the corner of your eye. A feeling that you may just chalk up to the seemingly endless barrage of horror movies on TV. Or the creepy decorations you walked past earlier in the evening. But what if there's something more? Today on Haunted American History. Hey, do you like things that are good? Of course, we all do. Well then, you're in luck. Because what I'm talking about today isn't just good, but it's free to boot. It's good, and it's free. And it's a movie. A free good movie. Sometimes you find a movie that's maybe good, but it's not free. Or it's free, and it's just awful. If you say you've gotten all three at once, that just means no one never slapped the lies out of your mouth yet. The movie is Welcome to the Future. It's honest, hilarious, and often touching. Maybe not as much as Jungle to Jungle 2 with Tim Allen, but what in God's name is? Oh, but check this out. The entire film takes place and was entirely shot at Comic-Con. Here's the thing, though. The filmmakers didn't technically have permission to do that. Put balls on these guys. You could see this triumph of guerrilla filmmaking on YouTube. Vimeo, which has a free download link for those that want to watch movies in a subway tunnel. Or you just want to be off the grid, man as well as your favorite torrent site or file sharing program. These filmmakers don't care if you pirate the film, man. So check it out one time, won't you? That's from Gremlins 2. That's Welcome to the Future. That's its name. That name again is Welcome to the Future. Oh, and I'm in it. Link is in the show description. Barry let out a long sigh. October was coming to an end, and Barry had been looking for a job for almost a month now. He used to work at a construction company until they started laying people off, and he had gotten the short end of the stick. It was particularly weighing on him, since most of his buddies at the place made the cut, but not him. He went to the fridge to get a cold beer. Barry felt the urgency of the situation when he saw that everything was almost empty, and there was only one bottle of beer remaining. Soon the simple luxury of a bottle of domestic was something that he wasn't going to be able to indulge in. He twisted off the cap and plopped down on the couch downtrodden. His eyes were fixed on an old framed photo by the coffee table. It was an old college picture of his wife and himself while they were still dating. He was so young and the world was seemingly at his fingertips. He had such hopes and dreams then. He felt invincible. He was a star lacrosse player playing both attack and midfield. Plus, he competed in the National Collegiate Boxing Association. The guy was a specimen. After being sidelined by a horrific knee injury, the depression of not being able to compete anymore got to him. He found his way to booze and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Bourbon and the Colonel had him in a headlock ever since. He looked up around the corner to the bedroom where his wife was sleeping. They were expecting their first child soon. Barry had a sweeping feeling of dread thinking about taking care of a baby and their current financial situation. He also felt some way about drinking a beer at 7.30 in the morning on a Tuesday, but he quickly put that thought out of his head. 
He took a big swig and grabbed the newspaper. Maybe people still put ads in these things for jobs. He sent his resume to over two dozen places and has been scouring all the top job hunting websites. He's had zero luck there, so he might as well go old school. He found the small help wanted section and searched all the advertisements posted there. Call after call, no one seemed to be interested. After around 15 calls, he noticed a small advertisement at the corner. It was a job of a seasonal position with the possibility of becoming full-time. The few lines mentioned overnight at a warehouse, but that was about it. It hardly explained what or where the job was, but he tried his luck anyway. Thankfully, this time the person who he spoke with on the phone not only told him he was hired, but he could start immediately, asking him if he could be there tonight. Barry couldn't say yes fast enough. Finally, after all this time, the weeks and weeks of nothing, at last he would be able to bring money home that he earned, and not having to feel the shame of knowing that his rent was being paid by his in-laws. Get those bad thoughts out of your head, Barry. It's time to celebrate. He didn't want to wake his wife. She needed the rest, but he had to tell someone. He checked his wallet and saw that he only had $14. Well, that was enough for a six-pack. Ricky down at the corner store would be thrilled for him. Did KFC serve breakfast? Barry celebrated throughout the day. Even made tacos for his wife and himself for dinner that night. And managed to sneak in a three-hour nap. That night, he went to the address that the woman on the phone gave him. It was in the middle of nowhere. There was a couple of minutes there where he thought he was being pranked. And he was mad at himself. How could he fall for the old fake job ad in the newspaper trick again? But then on the horizon, he saw the massive building. It was the bright pink and blue neon sign that caught his eyes. Super Happy Teddy Bear Factory was spinning on top of the building, spewing a glow onto the grounds around the building that made the parking lot look like a cartoon threw up. Pulling up to the security gate, which looked really legit for a place that makes teddy bears. In fact, the entire place was surrounded by double chain link fences topped with razor wire. Who knew toys were such a hot commodity? He gave his name, and they checked his ID, and they gave him instructions on where to go. Once inside, he made his way to the desk where another security guard asked him for his name and ID. He was given a temporary badge to carry around that would give him access to the grounds. He went through the normal onboarding motions. The lovely woman taking his information and helping him with his paperwork was named Patty. She told him that she'd worked there for over 40 years. And you know what? He believed her. If she said she worked there 80 years, he would have believed her. She was an ancient little thing. The skin on her face would stretch tight and almost transparent. But her skeletal hands kept giving him those little strawberry candies that only old women have for some reason. So she was cool in Barry's book. With all the formalities out of the way, Barry was taken downstairs into the warehouse and introduced to whom he would report to. His name was Charles. But when Patty walked Barry up to him, Charles declared that he liked to be called Chicky and that Charles was his father's name. Barry wasn't sure if Charles really was his father's name or if Chicky really didn't understand that particular joke. Chicky had silver hair and very broad shoulders, as well as an ear-to-ear grin all the time. He looked like he was nearing his 60s, but for someone who's an old-timer, Barry was sure he could run circles around him. God, I've let myself go, Barry thought to himself. It seemed that everyone they walked past went out of their way to come say hello to Chicky. Barry guessed he was some sort of de facto leader of the whole place. Even the night manager seemed to be the one that Chicky was giving orders to. The two men walked around the warehouse while Chicky gave Barry a quick tour. Chicky stopped up on a catwalk over the warehouse looking out over everything like an old sea captain and began explaining to Barry about the job. You see, Bob, your responsibilities here are basically custodial and pest control. The factory doesn't run at night, so once 11.30 hits, it's my skeleton crew keeping this ship sailing until the sun comes up. It's Barry, Barry responded. Chicky, now finally turning to look at Barry, scrunched his face up in confusion and said, I don't get you. The whole factory was split up into two sections. The main factory floor and the warehouse, which was slightly detached from the main building and was smaller. Chicky explained that the warehouse was mostly where Barry needs to work for now, as he wasn't experienced yet to move to the factory building. As if cleaning toilets in the factory was different than cleaning toilets in the warehouse, Barry muttered under his breath. As the tour continued, Barry noticed two strange things. One of a particular room in the factory building. It was sealed off, and Chicky ordered him never to go inside. His face was oddly serious, which was the first time Barry saw Chicky without his ear-to-ear grin. Chicky also addressed him as Cliff when he gave him this warning, 
which wasn't even a B name, so he was obviously making an impression on the man. The second thing was a dedicated room with the name Armory written above the door. Chicky said it was a joke, and it was a storage place for all their work equipment, but Barry noticed a few odd things in there among the mops and brooms. There was a spiked baseball bat, chainsaw, and various blades. Barry was getting a little annoyed, as he hated bad jokes, and he was sure that the office cut-up put those things in there after they named that room the Armory. He couldn't wait to meet that guy. Bunch of good chucks had by all. Gag. Chicky educated Barry on the history of the factory. He said this factory was over a hundred years old, and its purpose has changed a lot of times. Before teddy bears, they used to make cookies here. And before that, beer. He said back in the late 40s, after World War II, the government took a bunch of old Nazi scientists and had them working here developing weapons and all kinds of weird junk. They even opened a gate to hell! Chicky exclaimed with his ear-to-ear grin. Another stellar joke. This was going to be a long night. Before he knew it, though, the night was coming to an end. Barry had made a mental note on the layout of the whole place. He was hoping that they didn't expect him to clean it all. This place was huge, and there was no way that there was enough staff at night to handle this entire place. If he saw six different faces tonight, that was a lot. Afterwards, Chicky did some paperwork on his end and officially took Barry in. He told him he would start today. I don't want to say tomorrow, because then maybe you wouldn't come in tonight. Work in the graveyard shift takes some adjusting. Am I right, Bobby? A B name again. Getting closer. Barry replied with a resounding yes. That he would be here tonight. Even though he was sure he would hate this place and everyone inside of it, he was happy to be working again. And awful jokes aside, everyone seemed to be like a good person. Even the guy who refused to learn his name. He went home to tell his wife and they were both overjoyed, knowing their lives were finally taking a good turn. This episode of Haunted American History is sponsored by Podcorn. What's Podcorn, you ask? Well, I'm happy you did. Podcorn is an all-in-one marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities. Any ads that you may have heard on this show have been through Podcorn. They have connected me with some amazing brands, and the best part about it is how easy it is. With Podcorn, there's no middleman. Podcasters of all sizes can browse and choose opportunities right on the platform set their own rates, and collaborate with brands directly. You never give up any rights to your podcast, and Podcorn is here to support you every step of the way. They ensure you're protected and compensated for the work that you do for the brands. The Marketplace mission is to give podcasters transparency, creative freedom, and full control of how and when we modernize. Click the link in my show notes to sign up to Podcorn and start browsing sponsorship opportunities today. And again, I can't thank Podcorn enough for sponsoring this episode. Explore sponsorship opportunities and start monetizing your podcast by signing up at podcorn.com slash podcasters. That's P-O-D-C-O-R-N dot com slash podcasters. The following night, Barry arrived at the factory, and the night manager handed him his locker keys, where he found his cleaning equipment and uniform. Chickie greeted Barry and introduced him to the other night shift workers. There was Theodore and Kate. They handled the warehouse storeroom. James, the second in seniority under Chicky. There was also a few guys doing busy work that Chicky just referred to as the boys. Kate asked Barry if he would clean up around the loading docks as a new shipment of materials would be arriving in the morning. Barry got right to work. He grabbed a broom and the push cart with a garbage can attached to it and wheeled it over to the dock. He started sweeping and cleaning up all the empty boxes and various other leavings left behind by the day shift. Once his cart was full, well, truth be told, it was overflowing, guy was trying to make a good impression on his first day. He took the cart out to the dumpster. The dumpsters were situated between the warehouse and the factory, but its adjacent, as Barry recalled, was in the position of the restricted room. There was a small window sitting over the dumpster, and after getting the lecture of not being ready to work in the factory or whatever, and seeing how secure that door was, something inside told Barry to climb up and peep in. But upon further inspection, even if he had stood up on the dumpster, he wouldn't reach the window. Maybe if he found a sturdy box and balanced it on the edge? Stop it, Barry, he said out loud to himself. That's all I need to do. Fall off the dumpster trying to be a peeping Tom? I'm sure Osha would love that. For now, Barry let the curiosity go and resumed his work. And his night was very, very boring. He didn't know how time could pass so slow. He remembers at one point looking down at his watch and seeing that it was 2.25 in the morning. 
And after sweeping up some fluff that they used to fill the teddy bears and taking out another round of garbage, when he looked at his watch again, it was 2.23. But finally, the sun was on the horizon. And that meant it was quitting time. He got home, and he's never slept so good. The second night, however, something happened. Being that he had such an amazing night's sleep, he was ready for work and just feeling charged up much earlier than he wanted to be. He had decided to go in early. He was just strolling through the factory to get a better idea of the layout and to plan his night a little better. But really, just to kill some time before his shift, he noticed Chicky and the other night shift workers all huddled in the armory. God, he hate calling it that. And discussing something serious. Barry wanted to say hello, and he also wanted to know what they were talking about in case it was work-related. But something else stole his attention. The restricted room in the factory. The door was open. Curiosity got the best of him this time. Barry slowly pushed the door open and peeped inside. He was met with a rotten stench which made him instinctively pull back. The room was dark and ominous. It was filled with cobwebs and strange fleshy-looking molds. Barry noticed that the room was exceptionally hotter than the rest of the factory. It was like stepping into a sauna. As he scanned the room, he saw that the floor was cracked. The cracks were violent and uneven, to the point where he felt that if he took a step inside, the whole room would collapse. This isn't safe at all. No wonder this room is sealed off. Some new person like me would kill themselves in here. In the center of the room, he noticed that the cracks had led to giant broken chunks of concrete. There was a dark gaping hole in the middle of the floor. Before Barry could make his way further into the room, a chill hand grabbed his shoulder tight. He felt a chill run down his spine. Barry got pulled out of the room and when he turned around, his eyes widened. He saw the bright, cheerful face of Chicky. He let out a sigh of relief. Now, Benny, we talked about this, Chicky said. That room is off limits. Hey, boys, Chicky shouted to the guys Barry only knew as the boys. Who opened this? His question was met with a series of shrugs. Well, don't you think we should figure that out? The boys scattered in various directions. An odd group of guys, no doubt. Barry tried to ask about the room, but Chicky dodged all the questions and returned to his work. The shift started and Barry got to cleaning again. While he was working, he heard strange noises, but he really couldn't tell where they were coming from. Barry didn't pay much heed to it. After he was done cleaning some offices, he collected the garbage bags and took them out to the dumpster. This was becoming his favorite part of the night, going outside and just getting some fresh air. Even though the factory and the warehouse were tremendous, it felt stuffy inside. The cool, crisp October air was just what the doctor ordered on late nights like this. It was better than coffee. It woke him right up. As he was dumping the garbage bags, he heard a low growl. Barry instantly thought that maybe a stray dog had gotten into the dumpster looking for food. Barry's eyes quickly darted around the outside of the dumpsters, but he didn't see anything. He pulled himself up to the side to look over into the dumpster, but only made it about halfway up before his arms gave out. God, he had gotten fat. As he was stepping back, his eyes went toward the window up high on the wall. His heart froze when he saw it. There was a very vulgar looking creature. It looked like a frail man, but its flesh was burned and wrinkled. The places where its eyes were supposed to be were empty and covered with festering sores. Its many teeth looked like shards of broken glass where they were sticking out from its mouth, even piercing its lips. If you can call those lips, they were more like charred skin flaps. Barry felt his blood turn cold as the creature looked straight at him and shrieked. Without a moment's notice, it lunged itself off of the wall and straight at Barry, going for his face. Luckily, he managed to sidestep it. Muscle memory from his athletic days kicked in, but even then, the creature was too nimble. It grabbed Barry's leg and swooped him up, making him fall to the ground. It mounted itself over him and tried to bite his face, but Barry managed to hold it back. Its body was so frail looking, he'd have never guessed this thing could be so strong. It looks like a person whose body was on backwards. It was walking around on all fours, but its chest was clearly facing the sky. Its head was dangling between its shoulder blades, its jaws snapping in Barry's face. They both wrestled for control, but neither were giving in. He thought if he slipped or let loose for just a single second, he wouldn't be quick enough to get up and run for the building. The creature was going to kill him. Barry thought of his wife at home, with their unborn baby, and a burst of adrenaline came over him. He let out a scream with a show of intense power, overcame the creature, flipping it around, and with all his might, gave it a right hook. The creature looked dazed. 
Barry then started in with some major ground and pound. He was pouring it on, his arms working like pistons, punching this creature repeatedly in its face. Barry only realized the thing was dead when his fist started hitting pavement. Barry slowly got to his feet, the mangled corpse of this monster laying there between them. He stood there completely shocked at what just happened, and his hands throbbing and dripping with a black viscous substance. At that moment, Chicky burst through the door with a machete in his right hand. He looked at Barry, and then down to the creature on the floor. His expressions changed from a worried look to an excited one. Chicky exclaimed, You killed a miner with your bare hands? The question only made Barry more confused, and in a daze he just replied, I used to box. Chicky went and collected Barry and helped him up into the warehouse. Inside, Kate and James were standing on top of similar creatures that Barry had encountered. They were using a chainsaw to slice up the creature's body and pack it into garbage bags. Chicky, like a proud father, explained what had happened, and everyone looked impressed. Chicky then took Barry and went into the armory and explained what was going on. He explained everything. How the government owned this building, and how the teddy bear factory was a front. I mean, sure, they did sell them. If they could make a few bucks, they were going to make a few bucks. How the hell mouth that the Nazis opened still sits directly under their feet, and that the night workers are essentially Earth's guardians. And every year during the fall and leading up to Halloween, when the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest, the Hellmouth would open up and these creatures, these demons would come pouring out. We only assume they're demons, James said from behind Chicky. The people upstairs really keep us in the dark about these things. Barry took a glass of water, still trying to process what was happening. The water spilled all over himself as his hands were trembling so much. By the time the cup touched his lips, it was empty. Whatever it was that was going on here... He didn't want to get involved, but Chicky had other plans. He had never seen someone kill a miner with their bare hands, and he wanted Barry to continue working with them. Barry sat there staring blankly into space. He couldn't believe what just happened. This must be what shock is like. But his trance was pretty short-lived when it dawned on Barry that the next day was Halloween. Barry's whole body was sweating. The adrenaline rush had worn off, and he was feeling the gravity of the situation. He had to get out of here. Run and never come back. This place wasn't worth the $22 an hour was paying. No wonder they told him he was getting hazard pay. Stupid! He just about had his mind made up to get up and run out the door until Chicky opened his mouth. Jimmy, you ever see someone collect a bounty on their first week? Never happened, right? Jimmy just shook his head slowly and simply said, Nope. Bounty? Barry asked. What bounty? What does that mean? Chicky replied with, the person, or people upstairs, put bounties on these things' heads. A little incentive. I mean, no one in their right mind would stick around this place if it wasn't worthwhile. How much are we talking, Barry asked. His interest perked. For a miner like that, you're looking at three grand, Chicky said. Three thousand dollars? At that moment, the fear that Barry felt went right out the window. He thought about his family at home. This money could really make a difference in their lives. Chicky seemed to read his mind, and followed up with, this time of year, we can make a whole year's salary by the end of the month. You start late in the season, you can give yourself a beautiful little cushion until next year. Kind of makes the sweeping and toilet cleaning a little more bearable the rest of the year, huh? After a long pause, Barry looked at Chicky and told him his decision to stay. Chicky asked if he was sure. He knew the kid could handle himself against the miner, but would the kid crack if one of those big ones showed up? Only time will tell. And for them, that time was almost upon them. This was the first time Barry had seen Chicky this serious. He said, son, get yourself a good night's sleep. Celebrate your bonus with your family. Take your wife to dinner. Because tomorrow, tomorrow's Halloween. Barry swallowed hard and looked around the room at all the approving faces looking at him. He had a question pop into his head and asked why there weren't any guns or explosives around. If you guys know these things are going to come here, why not really be prepared with more than knives and sticks? Chicky's face went from serious... Back to his ear-to-ear -ear grin. I could have guessed this was going to be your next question. It's everyone's after they find out what goes on here. You see, Hank, guns and bombs are loud. And even though we are far out of the way, we don't want to bring any unwanted attention. Could you imagine if people found out what we were doing here? You know what? Barry agreed. He would never want his wife or his future kid to find out what he was doing. Barry looked around the place and picked up a spiked baseball bat, a set of knives, and some brass knuckles. The rest of the night, they were killing and mopping up all the little stragglers that came in through the hole. 
In the weeks leading up to Halloween, the activity increased. And you get a few here and there that made it through the Hellmouth, Jiggy explained. He made $13,000 that night. You couldn't slap the smile off his face. He went home and slept like an angel. Halloween was here. Barry was getting ready for his shift. His face was alert and serious. This was it. His wife hadn't seen him like this since college. She could see a change in her husband since he got this job. He was carrying himself differently. He gave her a long kiss and a squeeze on her bottom and made his way out of the house. He briefly thought that this may be the last time I ever see her, but quickly dismissed that. Barry reached the warehouse and immediately went for the armory. As he was preparing his equipment, Kate and Theodore came to get theirs. Theodore gave Barry some tips, like beheading them for quick disposal and how to keep your distance. Once they were done, Chickie was outside with James and the boys. Barry heard the same shriek as he did from his first encounter, but this time, it sounded like there were dozens of them. It sounded like someone was screaming from behind broken vocal cords. It literally felt as if the voice was singed. Barry mustered all the courage he could gather. Before he knew what was happening, he felt a sharp object pierce through his left shoulder. Barry saw it was the teeth from one of those minor demons. Without even looking, he swung his bat behind him, hoping to get his target, but to his dismay, the demon had already outmaneuvered him and readied itself for another attack. In that instance, the demon's torso split in half. Barry saw Chicky with his machete. The blood that covered the rusted blade was dark black now. With that, an all-out war broke loose. It was hard to stay in the position when they were this agile. These fast, fat, little doughy-looking demons came pouring out of the circle and started running circles around them, and Chicky screamed, Hillsberries! Aim for the legs! Barry kept swinging his bat in the fray. Sometimes the nail on the bat would hit one of the demons in the face, revealing tendrils of pulsing gore. One of the demons had managed to come close to Barry, but his quick reaction sense gave him enough time to pull out his knife and gut the cursed thing. Its entrails were leaking out and fell onto Barry's feet. They were filled with rotten, flesh-colored insects. Barry pulled away from the scene, feeling sick. He was separated from the group, but he was still hidden among the various boxes of teddy bear parts. As he was collecting himself, he heard some weird chewing sounds behind him. He saw some of the demons huddled together. One of them had a head in its mouth, which looked like a dog's head, but it was so chewed and marred it was impossible to tell what it was. Its skull was crunching under their jaws. The demons noticed Barry, and one of them charged at him. Barry held his bat tight and took a big swing, knocking it to the ground. He dropped to his knees and started slicing the demon's head off. The flesh felt like rubber, and the blood was surprisingly very cold. He figured he was better off with the knife than the baseball bat, and he went around the place slicing demons' necks like an overweight Rambo. The rest of his co-workers more than impressed with the newbie. The whole factory looked like the floor of a butcher's shop, if said butcher sold nothing more but inedible putrid meat. As they were routing some of the stragglers, a strange noise came from the restricted room. Chicky looked at Barry and said, Now we go in. Now you're qualified. He readied his machete and opened the door to the restricted room. There was a dark smog covering the floor. Fleshy veins were coming out from those broken holes. It tried to grab Barry's leg, but he managed to outmaneuver them and slice them off. Everyone was furiously cutting at the veins. They looked like giant squid tentacles. They were pulsating and filled with more of that cold black blood. As he was cutting it, he noticed some goo on the floor. It looked like pus, but Barry noticed there were eyes floating in it. There were at least two dozen eyeballs rolling and tumbling in the goo. And without a moment's notice, it shot up and onto Barry's face, cutting off his airflow. He was able to wrestle it off and free himself and throw the eyeball slime across the room. The pus-like goo turned into more of a sludge, and then it slowly started building up into another demon. Barry raised his blade in his right hand and brought his fist of his left hand up, essentially squaring up with the monster. This is the craziest story I've ever told. Just then, a huge figure started emerging from the hole in the middle of the room. It looked like a minotaur, standing at least eight feet tall and built like a bull. It had two huge horns, and its eyes were glowing blue, with its skin lava red. Barry understood now. Oh, minor demons. The demon charged straight at Theodore. He barely managed to escape, but not completely unharmed, as his left arm was speared by the horns of this nightmare creature. Chicky yelled to Barry, Center of the chest! Aim for the chest! Everyone was scrambling now. Barry didn't think his bowie knife would cut it and ran back to the armory to find something else. 
Frantically scanning the room, he spotted a rapier-like sword and some rope hanging on the wall. Barry had an idea. He quickly snatched them down. He was accompanied by Kate, who had taken a bow. They rushed back to the scene and took measures to immobilize the big demon. But their efforts were met with the sheer strength of this monster, raging and screaming. As they were in a seemingly endless battle, the demon suddenly stopped and started devouring the minor demons. It chomped on the flesh of the creatures like it was cheese, spewing black blood and pus all over the place. The wounds on this big bastard started closing up with every bite. Chicky looked over and said, Get ready, Barry. He remembered my name. Chicky took the opportunity and lunged with his machete for center mass. But he was immediately caught by it. It was like it set a trap. It took him up and held him tight in his monstrous hands. Chicky let out a scream of agony, and then there was a nauseating cracking sound. Chicky's head felt lifeless. Barry couldn't believe what he saw. That ear-to-ear grinning smile, that cheery face, was now expressionless. The demon took the other hand and squeezed Chicky's head until it popped, and his brain tissue exploded onto the floor and walls. The demon dropped Chicky on the floor and fixed his gaze on Barry. His hand started shaking again, but enraged. Barry charged forward and slid between the demon's legs. What the demon hadn't noticed was that Kate and James were already on its side and had wrapped the demon's legs up with the rope. They had all pulled and tripped the behemoth down. Without even a second delay, Barry took the rapier and plunged it deep into the demon's chest, effectively killing it. He then took up Chicky's machete and rounded up all the rest of the minor demons and slashed them into a pulp in a fit of rage. Once all the dust was settled, the sun was on the horizon. The team started cleaning the place and disposing the bodies. It was over, at least for that year. Barry still couldn't process it. The whole week was more excitement than he'd had in his lifetime. Everyone was mourning Chicky's death. The place wouldn't be the same without him. He took little comfort in knowing how well compensated his family would be with the loss of their patriarch. Money couldn't buy everything. Once most of the cleaning was done, James came forward and proposed Barry take care of everything and filled Chickie's shoes. It was clear that he saw what Chickie had planned. He was eventually going to train Barry to be his replacement. But when he retires, unfortunately, fate took him before that. Barry felt the same too. Chickie wanted him to stay. For Barry, this became much more than earning money. That night it changed him. He was looking for a job, but in return, he had found his purpose. With a heavy heart, he accepted and became a full-time employee of the night shift. Many months have passed since Halloween and the loss of Chicky. Barry was sorting some inventory in the stockroom when the night manager came in. He paused and gave a slight nod. Barry knew what he meant. A person had answered the ad in the newspaper. He mentioned the new hire would be arriving for orientation tomorrow. Barry thought back to his first day at the factory and how Chicky made him feel while showing him around the place. Now it was his turn to teach their ways. The torch passed from one person to another, all guarding the hellmouth against unleashing hell on earth. Summer was coming to an end. The night air was becoming increasingly crisp. On his drive home, he stopped at the local grocery store to pick up diapers for his son, and he saw the sign. The time to start making preparations was approaching. Back to school was already over. The seasonal aisle was beginning to transition. There was a sign above it that already read, Happy Halloween. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. Music by Kevin MacLeod.